he was my top athlete. He was my, my priority guy to work with. Um, I mean, he actually ended up winning the, the gold medal in Tokyo uh, after I moved on. But um, as well as being my, my top athlete, he was also my translator. So it was, it was a little bit of an interesting uh, situation, that one. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Working in Sport podcast. My name is James Grigson, and today we're joined by Chris Gallagher. Chris is a very experienced strength and conditioning coach and also associate lecturer. He spent time, a lot of time across the United Kingdom throughout the 2000s and spent the, the remainder of or into the 2010s across Asia in Hong Kong and China as a strength and conditioning coach. In 2020, he came back home to the UK and he's here now. Uh, Chris, thank you very much for joining us. Good to be here. Mate, uh, the, the biggest thing that stood out for me for your journey is the, the amount of time that you spent throughout the United Kingdom, you know, close to, close to about 10 years across a number of sports, and then about 10 years or close to it um, across Asia. Two very, very different scenes in the sports science, strength and conditioning world. Uh, it, it, can we start on maybe some of the fundamental differences between coaching over in the UK and coaching throughout Asia. Maybe, it, you know, whether it be language, whether it be the, the culture itself, whether it be uh, facilities, potentially the type of athletes that you have to begin with and how, you know, you want to develop them. What would be some of the, the big differences between both regions from a coaching perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the obvious one is the first one you came to is, is the language piece. So, um you know first off in hong kong that was that was a bit easier because you know as, as a british colony until 1997 you know english is pretty widely spoken there um so it wasn't so much of an issue but uh moving over to china was very very interesting working with the swimming team um you know the majority of the other uh coaches and practitioners i met out there they were normally uh, assigned a translator to work with so you yeah know, most of the coaching everything was done through a translator um, for whatever reason, the, the team I was assigned to, we, we didn't get a translator. So it was sort of between me and one of my swimming athletes who, uh, spoke a decent level of English, but certainly wasn't sort of fluent. So he was, he was my top athlete. He was my, my priority guy to work with. Um, I mean, he actually ended up winning the, the gold medal in Tokyo uh, after I moved on, but, um, as well as being my, my top athlete, he was also my translator. So it was, it was a little bit of an interesting, uh, situation, that one. Um, so yeah, that, that, that was obviously the biggest one. Um, yeah, culturally, um, I, I think a big one there maybe is, well, certainly when, when I was in Hong Kong at the Sports Institute, you know, the facilities there are outstanding. Um, you know, everything's on site. They're, they're really trying to sort of copy that English Institute of Sport or Australian Institute of Sport environment. Um, so, you know, there's a, a really sort of strong multidisciplinary team around all the sports. We've got um, dedicated sports science, S&C, nutrition departments, uh, you know, everything they could want is, is on hand. Um, so very, very well funded, very, very well supported. Um, I, I think sometimes perhaps some of them didn't realise just, just kind of how well they had it compared to maybe okay. some other countries and some other athletes and some other sports. So, um I, I don't want to say that they were entitled. That's that's not fair. That's not the right wording. But just you know, they they, they had an awful lot of support that perhaps if they were in a different part of the world, uh, they might not have had access to, and and maybe didn't kind of fully appreciate that sometimes. Um, and then also again, just culturally, like the way sort of in the UK, you know, we work in terms of time. Like you know, if, if training starts at ten, training starts at ten. Whereas mm. in Asia, you know, time is a little bit more of a looser concept sometimes, and. Uh, you know, you might have athletes kind of coming into sessions, you know, a little bit early, a little bit late, which, you know, maybe doesn't sound like a big issue. But um, I mean, when I was working in a multi-sport environment as well, so, you know, you're responsible for, say, the rowing team, the rugby sevens team, some athletes yep. from athletics, some athletes from squash, um, you know, that that kind of Western system of sort of things being a, a bit more organised and running a bit more like a, yeah, a well-oiled machine was certainly... Um, certainly would have been appreciated but you know it's just not their culture and so um 
yeah, just had to kind of manage my own frustrations sometimes, my own expectations. And so, yeah, that was, that was interesting. If a coach was to move into a different environment, like you did, whether it be to Asia or another part of the world where there are some cultural differences, like what, what, what did you do maybe to, to settle yourself? Because like you said, it would be maybe not, uh, I think you used the word frustrating, but it, yeah, un- unsettling in that they're not necessarily um, behaving, behaving in the way that you might want them to. How did you go about sort of mentally processing that and being able to move on so you can do your job efficiently and just not be, you know, not sit there and be frustrated? Yeah, I mean, you know, hands up when I first kind of went over there as, as a relatively young guy, you know, but at times certainly probably didn't handle that, um, you know, as, as well as I could all the time. And it's, you know, it's certainly something of a learning process. Um, so that's good, you know, when you can hear from the experiences of other people who went through that and, and sort of what they saw and, and what they did. Um, I mean, you know, to a degree, it's, it's like going into a, a new sport or a new club anywhere in the world, sort of ignoring those um, cultural differences. You know, even if you're moving from, uh, you know, one team in England to another team in England, yeah. the first thing you do is, you know, settle in and just observe what's going on and, you know, what's the culture, what are the standards of behaviour, what are the expectations, what are the, the relationships? So I, I think, you know, in that first instance, it's just kind of observing and taking note and understanding and kind of seeing how things work uh, and then sort of trying to find those opportunities to make little changes and, and, and make improvements. Um, and that's just human nature again, right? Like nobody wants sort of people coming in and, and sort of critiquing everything they're doing and telling them they're doing things wrong. And um, so, yeah, you know, just taking that little bit of time to sort of build relationships, build communication, uh, you know, understand where people are coming from. And, yeah, sometimes just accepting that, you know, culturally some things are different um, and, you know, you're moving into that culture, into their environment. So to a degree, you know, the, the onus is more on you to adapt to the way things are there rather than sort of expecting the world around you is going to, you know, sort of bend to your will. And you were sort of mentioning even transitioning from club to club or sport to sport in the UK, there are some differences. And throughout yeah. your time coaching in the UK, you know, you spent time with Scottish rugby, um, you Park City, you're at the Wasps, you were across a number of different, not only clubs, but sports and then, you know, countries, I guess, between England and, and, and Scotland. Um, a lot of people, at least from, especially uh, from what I've seen in Australia, I'm not too sure how common it would be across the UK, but you typically see people sort of stay in one sport um, or at least circle around one sport. They might jump a sport for a bit, but then flow back into their, mm. their normal niche there. Um, you, you've seemed to move across multiple sports. Is that something that you've always wanted to do? Uh, I, I see, you know, for, you know, we follow each other online and I see you've got an interest in a lot of different sports, not just mm. sort of a one sport kind of person, at least from a fan perspective. Was that something that you always wanted to do was work across as many sports as you can or did that just happen? Um. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd like to say that this was um, some sort of well thought out plan because I, I think there are, uh, you know, an, an awful lot of um, benefits to doing things that way. Uh, but, I, you know, I, I think for myself, it was more just sort of taking advantage of opportunities that came my way, basically. Um, but, you know, yeah, if, if I was to, uh, you know, go and sort of start my career again with sort of the knowledge I have now, uh, or, for example, when, you know, I'm, I'm doing some of those um lecturing roles and you know mm. sort of trying to uh, pass on a bit of experience to some of the students now I you know I definitely think there's a lot of um, a lot of benefits that go in and doing that um, you know going and working in team sports and then individual sports and just seeing the differences there um, or even sometimes you know if you pick something like rowing that I worked with in Hong Kong like on the one hand it's sort of a team sport you know they're all training together they may be trying to win seats on the same boat or, you know, they're competing for, you know, uh, a single skull or whatever it is. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a crossover there. But I just think, yeah, again, seeing these different cultures, seeing these different challenges, um, being exposed to coaches from different sports. So, um, you know, I, I think getting the opportunity to work in athletics or track and field is, is great for an SNC coach because, you know, traditionally the athletics coaches just did their own SNC. You know, they, they didn't mm. have an SNC coach who came in and sort of did that for them. So, uh, you know, I've met an awful lot of great uh, athletics coaches who sort of really understand that piece very, very well. Um, and, you know, in, in a lot of cases, a lot of sports sort of athletics is kind of, uh, you know, the foundation for uh, S&C, you know, sprinting, jumping, lifting heavy, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, so yeah, I, th- I think there's tons and tons of advantages of, of sort of going and spending time in different sports and just seeing, um, you know, different ways of doing things. I mean, you know, it just popped into my head even, but, you know, Eddie Jones, when he took over at England Rugby and people saw, you know, he was going off and spending time with, um, you know, I'm probably going to gonna butcher the story here now, but, but things like, you know, going off and spending time with Dutch hockey and, and stuff like that. And it was just, you know, maybe people thought it's a bit unusual. Why is he spending time with these other sports? But it's that same process, you know, just being open to learn from uh, different people and different ideas and, then, you know, when you get later on in your career, I think it's just going to make you, you know, a much a much stronger coach because of the breadth and the depth of things that you've seen. What's some of the more unique crossovers that you've seen? Like, uh, you know, I guess as a whole, you were saying, you know, if I go to, or even use Eddie Jones' as an example about going to Dutch hockey or going to different sports, you can pick things up. What, what's some of the, what's an example of the most unique crossover that you saw? Maybe you went into a new sport or you went into a new culture, you went into a new environment and you went, oh shit, like I can take that from athletics and apply it to, to football. I can apply it from here to here. What were some of the more unique things that you saw cross over where you thought they wouldn't necessarily cross over? Yeah, good question. Good question. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess a big thing you see in athletics is sort of these ideas of, uh, you know, special strength exercises. So, you know, um, I, th- I think again because those athletes do kind of excel to quite a high level in sort of the physical performance, so you can you can get a bit more creative in terms of what you're doing with, with yeah the sort of special strength exercises in the gym where you're getting a little bit more into that specificity piece. So yep. um, like with the the long jumper that we were working with in Hong Kong, we went to the Rio Olympics and we started incorporating uh, step throughs, which is um, just a variation, sort of a step up in the way in the gym that kind of mimics that that takeoff action a little bit. Um, See, so yeah, I, I don't know about the best example that I've seen, but but I, I think that's one that you know perhaps some other sports could maybe look into uh, applying. Is, is yeah, you know when when the athletes kind of earn the right, maybe looking into sort of those special uh, special strength kind of exercises in the gym would be a big one to take away from. Yeah, I think uh, you know um, having come from a rugby background. And believe it or not, played in the front row majority of my career. The unique scrumming related strength exercises that came from being a front rower and then being someone interested in exercise science, it was like you start just getting a little bit deeper and deeper. And, and then even going on and training people after that, not, not necessarily in rugby, they were just some of the things that, that I grabbed. So it's funny that you mentioned mm-hmm. that about your experience with athletics. The, the athletes, um, at least from some of the coaches that I've spoken to before, they've done some work across. Um, Asia, they've said that there is, uh, I guess, a, a larger spectrum of, of ath- uh, development across athletes when you receive them into the Institute. So, um, you know, you still might have the very top end athletes, but you might have some athletes that need a lot more development. As someone who spent a lot of time at the real top end professional level, was there something about going to an environment where there were more opportunities potentially to develop athletes that was more appetizing? And when you think about what roles excite you now? Do you think of the opportunity to develop an athlete who's sort of more emerging into professional, something more exciting, or dealing with a very top end, top end athlete where it's you know one percent gains in comparison? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think definitely my my own experience of sort of being in Asia, being in Hong Kong, being in China. Uh, you know, speaking to some of the other guys out there who worked in things like athletics and swimming. Um, I think part of the reason you get this wide spectrum is um, with their sports schools, they, they do do the sort of the early specialization across an awful lot of sports. So, um, you know, we, we know in some sports like gymnastics, for example, that that sort of early specialization is maybe necessary, um, but they sort of tend to do it across all sports. So then when you kind of get to that senior level, you get, um, you know, sort of the genetic freaks who are going to be successful kind of whatever they did. Uh, and then the rest of the athletes you get coming through have, have maybe missed out on that sort of foundational sort of, you know, fundamental movement principle stuff. So that's why when you get to that senior level, um, yeah, the, you really, really do get a broad range. And then some of them are just missing um, some of those basic pieces. Um, but then, yeah, as you said, as an SNC coach, that's, that's an opportunity there for you to have a big impact because there's things they haven't done that you can. Um, and sort of talking about future roles and opportunities. So, um, you know, because of COVID, that, that kind of led to me coming back from Asia and, and sort of while I'm back in the UK and 
started working at the university in the in the TAS program, so the Talented Athlete Support Scheme, um, which is you know more sort of um, university kind of aged athletes, so you know late late teens, early twenties. Um, and the cool thing there is, yeah, like you say, working with these athletes where you can have a big impact. So um, working with a fencing girl who's, you know, looking in a good position at the moment to potentially get sort of selected for a first major national competitions, you know, uh, potentially being in the Commonwealth Games World Championships this year. Um, working with a hurdle girl who's, um, you know, running PBs every time she runs at the moment and, and looking to go off to the under yeah, 20 like. championships. And yeah, yeah, you know, it's... Um, I'm, I'm not taking credit for that. She's just, you know, she trains hard and she's at that age where she's going to see regular improvement, but it's, you know, it's cool to be involved in that. Um, you know, she was, the they, they recently had the national indoor championships and she was the only um, girl in that final who was still uh, eligible for the under twenties. So, you know, she's showing a, a good potential at her age. She's sort of ahead of the pack there. Um, I'm working with like a squash player who um, she's going to break into the top hundred for, uh, the world rankings next month and uh, qualified for the world championships later this year for the first time. So um, yeah, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily my plan to come back when I did, but leading me into this role and having that opportunity to work with some young athletes who've, uh, you know, making some big strides already. And, and I think I've got, um, you know, a lot of potential and a lot they can be achieving over the next few years. So it's certainly yeah, very rewarding to be involved in that. And you mentioned your current role at Buckingham Shire University, mm. sort of leading SNC, but you're also doing some lecturing as well. I noticed there throughout your time in in uh, in Asia, you're also doing some lecturing. Do you, uh, I guess, uh, for coaches, um, do you see that as an important tool to stay close on the pulse to some of the academic literature? I guess I'm asking, you know, aside from maybe the financial benefits that come from lecturing and offsetting some of mm. the you know, the, the life costs that coaches that, that coaches have. Um, what are some of the more professional benefits of lecturing in your mind? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, if, if I think about recent examples and, and, and talking about that girl on the, the squash program, you know, if, if it wasn't, um, you know, she's not directly involved in the university. So if it wasn't for sort of my involvement there, we wouldn't have access to their facilities. So, you know, we couldn't go in and do the force plate testing and we couldn't go and do VO2 max testing because, you know, the SNC she does with me is out of, you know, my home gym in my back garden, which is, you know, it's great. We've got the squat rack and everything we need, but, you know, we don't have access to all the high end um, sports science and sports nutrition. And um, so, yeah, you know, I, I think it just kind of it helps broaden that network. You know, it helps open up opportunities, um, you know, as you kind of alluded to as well. Um, you know, once you've kind of graduated university and you move on and you go and work some places, you maybe don't have such easy access to all the latest research and that that's coming out. But if you're involved in a university, then, you know, you're not going to have any problems getting access to papers. Um, you know, within that university, again, there, it it builds out my sort of network of, um, you know, rather than just S&C coaches, but uh, sports medicine, physios, yeah. uh, nutritionists, psychologists. So, yes, yeah, just, you know, opened me up to a whole whole other uh, um, group of practitioners who you know similar to myself um, except whilst their roles are maybe primarily lecturing they're still you know working in implied environments as well so it's not often that you see that combination of applied and academia I think there's almost a bit of a divide in the industry um, if you could do it again would you have that blend would you have more of a blend would you have less of a blend in sort of your career path between academia and practical I mean, from, from my own perspective, I, I definitely enjoy the applied stuff more. Um, for sure, I do. Um, you know, that, that's that's kind of what I'm, I'm really sort of passionate about. But yeah, I think, you know, having, um, you know, having some hooks still in, into that academic side and just, uh, you know, I, I think that can kind of keep you on the straight and narrow a little bit more and, and make sure that you're not getting too much into sort of rules of thumb and grey areas. And, you know, that, that, that is a massive part of sport and sports science. Um but yeah, you know, I think just just being involved with the university, with the with the research side, with the academia, and and, and just making sure um, that yeah, you know, everything you're doing is, is kind of legitimate, is well backed in science, um, and that, that can be done without that academic piece. You know, there, there's an awful lot yeah. of good sort of evidence base from the applied world. Um, but yeah, that maybe just kind of help keep you honest, and uh, and yeah, again, just keep you abreast of the the latest research and information that's coming out. In terms of 
I sort of mentioned if you could do it again. Um, one of the questions I have is for people that are starting out, and this might be an easy one for you to answer given that you are uh, lecturing at the moment, but if anybody's mm -hmm. starting out in the industry, what advice would you give them? Yeah, you know, I, I think a big one for me when I when I look back at it is, um, you know, the opportunity to go to, to Hong Kong and, um, you know, start leading on on national programs. You know, I, I was the national lead for the rowing program, um, for the athletics program, for the rugby sevens program at different times. Uh, and I think, you know, had I stayed in the UK, those sort of opportunities either might not have come along to me or might have taken even longer to get there. Um so, yeah, you know, be, being able to work directly with and, and, and sort of lead, uh, you know, the high performance team for guys who were going to Olympic Games, going to World Championships. So if I look back and one thing I think I could have done better and it wasn't it wasn't I didn't sort of try and cast my net as wide as possible. You know, I, I did look at opportunities in um, the US, in Canada, um, predominantly in, in English speaking countries. But looking back now. Um, and, and the way I got into Hong Kong was uh, it was um, a former classmate from Edinburgh Uni where I did my master's. He was already out there, uh, yep. sent me a message. There's a job opportunity coming up here. Are you interested? Uh, and, you know, it kind of made me realize, well, if he found out about those opportunities and he was already there, like, you know, they are out there. So for, for me, it was just um, being even more open to go and look in places and, and, you know, do more research and just really sort of try and understand what's out there. Um, and yeah, probably the biggest one for me, just go and work abroad. Um, you know, it just, it broadens your experiences. Uh, you know, like we said before, kind of the more sort of um, broader and wider kind of experience you've had sort of culturally, uh, you know, different nationalities, different languages, uh, and even away from sort of the sports science, the S&C and the coaching, you know, if, if I hadn't done that, um, I wouldn't have gone and seen the Great Wall of China. You know, I wouldn't have gone and, um, you know, gone snorkeling with um, with manta rays in, in Fiji. Um, off the back of that, I've gone and done CPD things all over sort of Australia, New Zealand, uh, America. So, you know, all, all these kind of interesting, um, you know, cool places and cities I've visited. Uh, I went to the World Squash Championships in Cairo. So, you know, went to Egypt for the first time. So, wow. yeah, definitely for me, if, if there's opportunities to go and walk, work, work abroad, sort of jump all over that and, you know, get involved. What are some of the, you know, you sort of spoke about those things away from the strength and conditioning sports science world. What do you think is so valuable about having those experiences? Obviously, you know, it's cool. You've got the photos or, you know, you've mm. seen some really cool things. But, like, you know, personally speaking, things that developed you, what do you think was some of the biggest benefits of having lived abroad and been able to travel abroad so much through sport? Yeah, I, I just, it comes back to that cultural thing, I guess. You know, if, if you stay in your, your home city, you know, your home country, if you don't go in and meet people who've had different life experiences and, and you know, just view the world a different way, then, um, you know, to a large degree, you might not be very different from sort of the, you know, the person in the town that you kind of grew up in. And, um, you know, not to say there's anything wrong with that either necessarily, but yeah, I just think, you know, having that opportunity to go and, um, yeah, visit different countries and, and, and see how people do things differently. And, um, you know, again, maybe coming from sort of Western culture and being in big cities and everything sort of, you know, uh, rush, rush, rush all the time and meeting deadlines and doing that kind of thing. So, you know, being in Southeast Asia and spending time in, you know, Thailand and relaxing and, and yeah, just seeing a different way of, um, you know, viewing the world and going about your day. And yeah, it's, it can only help people grow as an individual, can't it? I think so. Yeah, more forgiving, more understanding, more mm. empathetic. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. I like. Would you would you go would you go again? Are you, are you thinking that uh, now the world's opening up a little bit? Could you see yourself traveling and working abroad again? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've I've always kind of had the same approach to my career, really. So, like when you when you asked earlier on about you know how come I've you know spent a bit of time in football than rugby, you know I've done a bit with athletics, rowing, squash. Um, I think that's because I just, you know, I am open to new opportunities because, you know, of all the benefits we've spoken about of, of how yeah. that can help you, um, you know, professionally and, and also, um, you know, away from, from your work life. So, yeah, you know, if, if good opportunities come up somewhere, if, if people are looking for an s and who's, you know, had experience like I have, and yeah, definitely, I'd be open to, uh, to going somewhere different for sure. Chris, I really appreciate your time. For anyone that's watching and wants to 
subscribe, you can subscribe up here. If you want to watch the last interview through the Working in Sport podcast, you can click down here. For Chris, I'm James. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the rest of your day.